What is up you guys? Welcome to the video. My name is Armon. If you're new to this channel, I'm a deep and progressive house DJ and producer based out of Toronto, Canada. And this YouTube channel is aimed at beginner and intermediate level DJs. And it's full of video lessons and tutorials, both on the business side of DJing in terms of getting gigs and promoting yourself and the actual technical mixing side of things to turn you into a better DJ. So if you haven't hit that subscribe button already, please do so to keep up to date with all my tutorials and lessons. All right, so this video, as promised, is the answers to the Ask Me Anything video that I posted last week. And I've got to say thank you so much for all the responses and all the questions. I think there was over 50 questions that popped up after a few days. And I'm really having fun interacting with you guys on the channel. And so I've picked the top uh, eight questions. And as I promised to do, I've divided that into the business side of DJing and also some technical mixing questions. All right, guys, so here we are at the turntables to deal with the second section of this video. Let's answer some questions that have to do with the technical aspects of DJing. And our first question comes from Hans, and Hans wants to know what you're supposed to do when you're playing two tracks and you hear that one of them is slipping while both of the tracks are already playing on master volume. Adjusting it with the jog wheel makes one track sound very weird, or do you adjust it very slowly? All right, great question, Hans. This is a problem that all DJs who do manual beat matching have to deal with at some point as they imp improve their mixing skills up to the next level. This applies equally to playing on vinyl as on uh, CDJs. So remember, pitch in music, speed and pitch are related. Speed uh, is pitch because if the music is made to go faster, it will sound like the pitch raises. And if the music is temporarily made to go slower, that's gonna make the pitch uh, drop down. So let's look at some examples of that. Okay, hear that? When I speed up the jog wheel, or when I move the jog wheel forward, it's having the effect of temporarily speeding up the music. So if you listen carefully, Hear the music speed up for a second, you can hear the pitch raise and it kind of whines for a second. And if I slow it down by moving the platter the other way, okay? So what Hans is talking about is trying to eliminate that sound when you're beat matching and you have to make an adjustment because the beats are slipping out of sync. So Hans, you're sort of on the right track with your question about can you just do it very slowly. I assume you mean to move the platter a very little bit at a time. So let's hear how that's going to sound. Okay, as you can hear, it doesn't sound that bad as long as I do very slow, quick, or sorry, small and quick movements on the platter. So you can get away with a certain amount of that. Uh, during your live mix to avoid hearing this. Right, so instead of making one big motion where you spin the wheel, uh, you know, let's say one eighth of the way around, like, like that, you're just gonna do three or four really small movements at a time, okay? Now, here's the better way to uh, deal with this, if, especially if you're doing a mix and there's a lot of melodies or vocals going on and you don't want to move the platter really at all because when you have vocals or lingering note melodies going on it really does sound a lot worse. So here's the trick around it. See when I move the pitch fader with between about 2 to 3 BPM you can't really hear that big of a difference. The pitch fader adjusts speed too, but you can do this incrementally. Temp temporarily speed up the track by moving the pitch fader down. And then once the beat match is corrected, move it back. Let's take an example in uh, digital audio quality with the overhead view.
Okay, Hans, so there you go. The name of the game is small adjustments to the platter at a time only. And when that's not working or you want to be really, really discreet, rely on your pitch fader instead and get comfortable using your, bit, your pitch faders to uh, control your beat matching as opposed to only relying on spinning the platters around. It's good to have both of those skills. And technical question number two comes from Derek. Derek asks, what's the average mix time? It seems like I try to make the mix very subtle and it takes too long, which sometimes if I don't pay enough attention, I get lyrics over lyrics and it sounds awful. I use beat loop a lot to help offset this for my incoming song, but I feel it's the wrong way. Thoughts? Okay, Derek, so uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely encourage going for long mixes because I think they tend to sound better. They allow them to be more seamless and they allow you to bring in, bring in the volume and the EQ more subtly, more slowly for a really smooth transition. Now, uh, the problem that you're experiencing just goes to show you the importance of knowing your music library. So uh, one way you can avoid this problem is don't mix a lyrical song, a song with vocals, into another lyric song, right? So a lot of DJs prescribe this rule, you know, alternate, play a track with no vocals, then play a track with uh, vocals and so on and so forth. Uh, don't layer up vocals and vocals. Uh, that way you're never gonna run into this problem. Now, I don't necessarily follow that rule. Sometimes I like to play two, maybe three vocal songs in a row and then I won't play any for like an hour. It depends on what I'm trying to do in the set and on the feedback I'm getting from the crowd. But um, people like vocal tracks generally. I think they get the dance floor moving and they allow people to dance a little bit more because there's, you know, there's a human vocal element to that and people can really identify with it. So what I'm gonna do is demonstrate for you two mixes. One where I'm gonna do a bit more of a safe mix where I'm gonna mix out where the last song has about one minute left. Usually any lyrics are done by that time. And I'm gonna do that mix for you and you'll see it's a little bit more abrupt and it doesn't sound like quite as smooth as a transition. Then I'm gonna do a longer mix and I'll try and do this with a song with vocals. And I'm just gonna show you that I tend to try to mix for about a full two minutes. Uh, sometimes even two, two and a half minutes are left on the song that's currently playing live when I start to bring in the next song. So I'm really trying to stretch it where I can. And that's also where uh, mixing in key comes in handy as well. Because if you're mixing out of key, you're not gonna be able to get away with these really long mixes if the melodies are overlapping too much. You've gotta be mindful of the song structure, which is that typically um, electronic music like Deep House and Progressive House, the melodies and the lyrics will tend to drop away around the maybe minute and a half to minute mark and then some of the melodies will slowly drop away and then typically they'll leave you with just a beat and a bass line to kind of mix out. That's actually done so that DJs can have a bit of an easier time mixing the music, right? So don't be shy to mix vocals, but just learn your music, maybe set some cue points on the tracks so that you're gonna uh, be prepared in advance and know when the lyrics are gonna start and when they're gonna end and you don't run into this problem. But let me just demonstrate for you the advantage and why it sounds better to do a longer mix that's about two minutes in length. Let's go to the decks.
All right, so Derek's question about trying to avoid mixing vocals on vocals, but still wanting to do longer mixes, it actually leads us very nicely into the third technical question that we're gonna look at today. This question comes from EXO Ranger, and they're asking a lot of things here, but the main thrust of it is that uh, in, in mixing with EQs and volume faders, uh, the feeling is that the mixes sound too abrupt um, and asks, I'm trying to do it very slowly. I think the total time it takes is about 32 bars for the transition. I can hear the upcoming song coming in when I listen back to my mix. Is that normal? I just feel that it's not a really smooth blend. All right, well, yes, it's normal to hear the track coming in, especially if it's the music that you've, if you're the DJ and you've, you know, you've listened to these songs before and you know how you mix them, you can't unforget that information, right? So you're gonna know typically when you can start to hear a song coming in. You know, every once in a while, I might pull off a, a mix that's so smooth in one of my sets that when I listen to it back, a week or two later, maybe I can't quite tell. And when the new song really picks up momentum, it kind of surprises me. And I say, oh, I pat myself on the back, right? I say, oh, that was a really good, smooth mix. So uh, that might be your, your gold standard. If you can try and fool yourself, you've certainly fooled the audience and the listeners. Um, but having said that, uh, reality is most mixes aren't that seamless, but the goal is to make them as seamless as possible. So don't be too worried if you can hear the mix coming in. Um, now, I think what you want to do is p take a, a look at your mixing style technically with the volume faders and the EQ levels. What I like to do when I'm mixing is to throw the volume faders actually to full, to 100%, in one abrupt motion. But the reason I'm doing that is that first, I've killed the bass and the mid-range EQ all the way to zero. Now, on Pioneer mixers, these are almost complete kills for those uh, frequency bands. You've got to check this out on your mixer because not every mixer is the same. And some are uh, complete kills for sure and others are still letting a little bit of sound squeak through. But what I do is I kill these to zero and then I can just throw this in. If the song I'm uh, bringing in has a very hot hi-hat, I might even turn this down a little bit because I've checked it in the queue first in my head headphones. But typically I find with this mixer, Pioneer DJM 800, and most songs, I can just leave the high, high range, the treble knob at 12 o'clock and just throw this in. And then I'm mixing, so this song over here, say, is playing away at full volume because I'm going to bring this song in. And I start to open up the EQs very, very slowly. So with this, you might have a bit more control than making a combination of moving the volume fader up with your finger and working on the EQs at once. I think that's asking for trouble because you're, you're demanding too much of yourself to do two, two things at once. I think you, know, you have to pick a, a method of mixing and I think uh, I prefer with EQs because you get a lot more control out of it. It's hard to use your fingers and get this to move in a very slow linear fashion, especially if you're gonna start bringing down the volume on the other one. So the way I mix, and I've, I've got a video dedicated just to this topic, so please check my past videos. It's called How to EQ Mix, is I'm leaving both of these at full, 100% volume, and I'm very slowly sculpting the sound, right? You get a lot of control with these EQ knobs. So I'm bringing the mid-range uh, to maybe, say, I don't know, 40%, and I'm bringing this bass to about maybe 25% here, before I start to, so this song, you can start to hear it a bit, before I start to trim down the bass on the outgoing track. And so what you wanna listen for here is to have a consistent level of bass, because you're, you're transferring bass from this song over to this song, and you wanna do that delicately so that the, the total gain level of the bass doesn't jump up and down you know, too low or too high. You want, you want that bass sound to stay constant in the middle. So I'm sculpting this, bringing the bass slowly, slowly in, and this one slowly, slowly down, and the mid-range, the same thing. And you know once I finally have it in a position where the new song is dominant, like, like we have now, these can slowly be put over to 12 o'clock, and this song now is running at full normal levels on all EQ bands. And then you can slowly just kill off the rest of this, this track here. And because it's the outgoing track, I will start to bring the volume fader down slowly in conjunction with the EQ knobs as well. Okay, and what's a question and answer video without one bonus question, all right? I've got one more question to answer, and that's the 
ultimate question for all DJs. It's from Mervyn Nakoshana, who asks, what does it take for a beginner DJ to reach the pro level? All right, so <laughs> this is a tough one to tackle, but I'm gonna try and do it in two minutes or less. It depends exactly what you mean by pro, but I'm assuming you mean an international DJ who travels the world, plays in different countries, and actually makes a strong living doing that, as opposed to a local DJ who gigs a lot and just grinds it out and makes enough money to get by. Uh, so let's say we're setting our sights on being an international level DJ. What it takes, I believe, and I'm not the best person to ask because I'm not an international DJ. I still have a day job. I know some of you guys have asked me that. Um, but from what I see in the industry and from knowing some other Toronto DJs who have gone international is you do need to produce music. I think gone are the days when you can just be a really, really good DJ and never put out any productions. I think you, you really have to do both in this day and age. So uh, DJing a certain level of skill, uh, regular, regular gigs, residencies, regular podcast, um, producing music is number two then. Number three, strong online uh, social media presence. And number four, you know, sadly, like many industries, it's just networking and who you know. You need a little bit of luck. So, you know, I equate becoming an international DJ to being really discovered as like a pop star or a famous rock band, right? You've got to have the good music. You've got to have the skill. You've got to be personable and have the networking skills. And that's something you can always practice. And you've got to get discovered, right? So you've got to have a little bit of a big break. You've got to have that moment when some of your music gets signed to a European record label, uh, where electronic music is alive and well and is stronger than it is in North America, right? So Spain, Italy, uh, Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, these are all places where it might be smart to move to if you're really serious about becoming an international DJ and trying to approach record labels there and get them to sign your productions and then they're gonna help you to get bigger and bigger gigs. I think that's the path that you can try and take through record labels, but uh, certainly you've gotta do a lot of legwork on your own to promote yourself, make sure you deliver consistent, uh, high quality sets, be professional, you know, don't show up to your gig too drunk, don't have, many, have too many beers, you know, be nice to all the staff, be nice to the sound guy. You wanna be known as a professional, courteous DJ who always delivers a product that the promoters can count on. So if anyone has some other tips on how to become an international pro-level DJ, please share, because I would love to hear them as well. All right, you guys, that's gonna wrap up the questions and answers for this video. Thank you so much for posting so many great questions. And remember, if you didn't get your question answered in this video, do check back on the original Ask Me Anything post from last week, where I'm gonna try and answer as many of the questions as I can in the comments section. I hope you learned something, both about the business side of DJing and as well some technical skills that you can take to your mixing going forward. And if you learned something from this video, please hit that subscribe button and do share this channel with any of your friends who are getting into DJing. All right, thanks for tuning in. We'll look forward to seeing you back here for the next video.